Hey there, everyone. Today is the 21st of February, 2021, and we're going to keep going with our class in Rediscovering Jesus. Um, every once in a while, I like to do something that's a little bit apologetic in nature. And, uh, of course, you know what I mean by that is, is doing Christian evidences, right? Not apologizing for being a Christian, uh, but rather um, giving evidence for why we are, are Christians. Because Peter talks about that, right? Uh, talking about giving an answer for those who ask for the hope that is in us. And what is important for us to understand is that there are good, there's good evidence for that, Right? Um, and one of the things that we have to realize is that the Bible is a historical faith. And what we mean by that is it is a, um, a, a religion that is deeply rooted in history. And you look at other religions, and that's not the case, right? Pagan religions of the ancient world, that was not the case with them. Um, they were mythological in nature. And that is essentially a word for non-historical, right? And so that's not the case. Generally speaking with Christianity, for the first time you had a historically based faith. Well, the Judeo-Christian faith, I'll put it that way, right? Because in the Old Testament, that is very clear that that's a historically based faith. Um, and so... Uh, you know, God really did deliver the Israelites out of Egypt. God really did settle the people in the land of Canaan. God really did do these fantastic things for his people so that they could grow and flourish, and he gave them revelation uh, and all that. Christianity comes along and continues that story, and then once that's complete, now you have the world's first historically-based faith. It led to a lot of pretenders, um, or copycats, maybe, would be a way of putting it. And so then you have Islam coming along. And, well, there really was a historical Muhammad. And they really did do things, and those things are recorded in the, um, in the Muslim holy texts. Okay? And then you've got other things like, you know, um, Roman Catholic Church has kind of a variation on that. Uh, with, um, you know, its emphasis on saints being real historical figures, not some, you know, supernatural beings or something like that. They were actually people who supposedly were canonized as, as saints and now are, are you know, these, these individuals to whom people can pray and all that. Um, well, the, the problem is that actually does come from pagan religion, right? The idea of saints actually came from pagan religion. So that's a little bit of a problem. That's kind of a mismatch. Then you've got Mormonism that comes along in the, you know, 1800s. And so you have all, all these things that, um, that eventually come to the forefront among the world religions. And Christianity was the first to, to do that, right? And so it's important. It's important to connect Christianity to history because you can't have one without the other. Um, they're, they're, they're too too connected. Well, there are people in our world who are absolutely convinced that Christianity is no different. And so Christianity is just like every other world religion that isn't ha that doesn't have any historical footing. And what they do to uh, support that idea is to say that the church, uh, was a copycat in itself. It, it plagiarized pagan religions, and that's where Jesus came from. He's this um, pagan god that sort of got uh, a makeover and and became the founder of, of the church. And so um, this is something that is that is gaining traction in our world because our world seems to be, um, it, it seems to be, less reliant on facts and more reliant on emotions. People think with their feelings nowadays, it seems. And so, um, you know, history is not, is, is not objective. It, history becomes a tool, and it becomes a tool for you to promote your agenda, right? And so if you have um, something that you want to convince other people of, 
Uh, history becomes something that you shape and you mold uh, that, uh, that, that is simply designed to, to promote your point of view uh, instead of being something that should form your point of view. Um, well, that's, that's not the case anymore. Um, and so you have this, this very disturbing idea that you can't trust history and that uh, if you really look into it deeply, um, Jesus never existed. He was never a real person. He never you know, did any of the things the, the, the Gospels um, talk about. He was just simply this fictional creation. So that's that's where we are today, and and there are a growing number of people who who actually believe this. I mean, this is absolutely unbelievable uh, from someone who has a has a degree in history, and from the standpoint of someone who understands how history works and how historical texts inform our view of the past. This is absurd, but it's where a lot of people are because we don't think with our minds anymore we think with our emotions and maybe we have a bad experience with the church or had a bad experience with a christian or you know we we grew up christian but somehow got um, disillusioned or disappointed with the church and now we we don't like it we want to we're going to crusade against it and who cares what the actual facts are i don't like the church and so I'm going to use whatever arguments I can to undermine it. And I think that's actually where some people are. Um, it's very disreputable. It's, it's, it's a very dishonorable thing. But not everyone cares about that. <laughs> not everyone cares about being honorable. Well, there are um, uh, lots of different motivations for that. And, and one, one of those things is, well, maybe I'll, I like something else that, that fits my style better. And, you know, there we have to go back to passages like Proverbs 14, 12. Uh, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is death, right? There are a lot of things in this world that we can see that are, that may sound good, right? They may sound like, like there's something we're in, we should be interested in or something that, 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 that really fits the way we think um, instead of, facts shaping how we th how we think right the facts tell us that this universe couldn't have just popped into existence by itself the facts tell us that the earth is in a very privileged position everything is just right it's called the goldilocks principle uh, everything is just right for life on earth and the conditions are so specific for life on earth that we um, we think that uh, it, it probably doesn't exist anywhere else. In fact, there was a study done recently of, of hundreds of planets, uh, and scientists uh, call it exoplanets, right? Planets outside of our solar system. And scientists looked at it and basically ruled out every single one of these as a potential planet for life to exist because it didn't meet the criteria. It didn't seem to meet the conditions that we have here on Earth. And so um, we do seem to be alone in this universe uh, in terms of life, right? There, there are lots of planets and lots of galaxies, I mean, billions of galaxies, but we seem to be the only ones, right? Th those, are, those are facts, right? Um, Christianity is different from any other religion. Christianity doesn't seem to have come from or evolved from any other religion. Those are facts, right? All of those facts have to be taken into account when we are trying to determine how we should view our world and our place in the world. Not everyone cares about those things. And so they have a very different view of, of, of things and, and of evidence than, um, than other people do. Well, this is one of those things that's sort of behind this, this view that Jesus never existed. And the, uh, the fact is, when you go to scholarship, uh, when you go to scholarship, you will see that scholars 
almost every single one of them believe Jesus was a historical figure. Now, that's not what one of these people is going to tell you. One of these people who believes that Jesus was nothing more than a myth, what they're going to say is, oh, scholars know Jesus never existed. In fact, you've got some of them who know he didn't exist, he never existed, but they can't tell you that because it might put their job at risk. Let's say they teach at a graduate school or a seminary or a divinity school. They know that Jesus never lived, but they can't tell you that or else they might get fired. Well, all of that is garbage. All of that is absolutely untrue. Um, and uh, when, when you look at guys who are atheists, you see people who believe that in the historical Jesus. Now, they don't believe in, that he's a spiritual authority. Uh, that's very clear, right? Uh, they, they don't, they're not Christians. But in spite of their atheism, they believe Jesus really lived. And so you have guys who, who make very, very profound statements, uh, pronounced statements that are very clear. Jesus actually lived. And if you doubt that, there's something wrong with you. Uh, the, really, I mean, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to be condescending, and I'm not trying to be funny. But the opinion of scholars is, if you don't believe Jesus really lived, you haven't looked at the evidence. You've got some kind of bias that is controlling how you see things, how you see evidence, and so uh, it just simply is is not reputable at all. But that's not what we hear. It's not what we hear in our in our world. Well, there are several guys in the ancient world who mention Jesus and who um, tell us a little bit of something about him or about early Christians. And the first of those guys is uh, a man named Josephus. Josephus was a, was a Jewish historian who worked for the Roman emperors, the Flavian dynasty of emperors. And the Flavian dynasty was um, Vespasian... Titus and Domitian. Okay, those those three guys made up the Flavian dynasty. Um, they were also the ones responsible for you know destroying Jerusalem. Um, so uh, they, they're in that in that era from about sixty nine to ninety six uh, A.D. in the first century, kind of kind of rounding out that last like almost a third of the. Um, First century is when these guys lived, and, and Josephus worked for them, and, and he was a historian. And he mentions Jesus in two places in his writings. Now, we have to understand this and put this into its proper context. Josephus has no reason to mention Jesus. He's not a Christian. That's very clear. He is not a Christian. He's working for the Roman emperors. And there's no real reason for him to mention Jesus. He has no loyalty to Jesus. He didn't know Jesus. Um, he's not a Christian. Apparently, I would be willing to bet he probably didn't have any friends who were Christians. Uh, or if he did, they weren't very many. Um, and so you've got a guy who, who just sort of mentions Jesus in passing. But the very fact that he had no reason to mention him and he mentions him in passing, kind of lets us know that he interpreted Jesus to be a real person. And so there's there's two places in his book called The Antiquities of the Jews where he mentions Jesus. And, and one of them is just kind of outlines some basic details of his life. And it gets a little bit complicated because there seem to be some little small snippets in there that, that a later Christian scribe might have added. And we don't know how that happened. Um, sometimes that happened in copying manuscripts in the ancient world. You would have a scribe who would maybe be copying something. Oh, and I forgot something, right? Oops. And so I write it in the margin instead. Maybe I'm copying something and my eye skips a few words, okay? And I realize I've made a mistake, but I don't want to have to start all over again. Huh, copying is a tedious job. And so what I do is I make a little note in the margin. You know, make sure you, you know, the here... You, you, you make sure you add these words because that's where they belong. And sometimes maybe it got its way back into the text by somebody else, by the next guy who copied it. Maybe it didn't, right? And so uh, maybe there are some times when you're copying something and you give your commentary on the side. Uh, you make just a little note on the side. 
And the next guy who comes along thinks, oops, well, maybe, maybe you meant to include that. And so what he does is he puts it back into the text. And that's where you get some of these, these um, later insertions into the text. Uh, they're called interpolations, right? And so um, uh, maybe this happened. We don't know. But there are some, some details that he mentions that don't seem like they would come from somebody who was just a Jewish guy working for Rome, uh, because who was who was not Christian, okay. But he does mention Jesus, and there's another one. Now a lot of atheists really like to camp out on that verse, uh, on that passage, um, because uh, because it does seem to have some some issues with it, and so they'll say scholars universally reject this. No, they don't. No, they don't. And then, but there's a second reference where he mentions Jesus in passing and talks about James, the brother of Jesus, who was stoned to death by Jewish authorities. Now, no scholar, no scholar anywhere that I know of disputes that reference. So even if you have a problem with the first one, you still got to deal with the second one, where he actually not just mentions Jesus, but mentions Jesus, the half-brother uh, of Jesus, who was killed by Roman authorities, or, or, or I'm sorry, Jewish authorities, right? So you've got two solid references to Christ in the writings of a man who had no loyalty to Jesus, who had no personal interest in Jesus. He just, he, he, he's writing about his people. And at one point, Jesus was a pretty hot thing with his people. And so he just includes this little reference to him. Um, and of course, Jesus only predates Josephus by, you know, a generation or so. Um, and so that's, that's uh, uh, you know, part of the reason why he mentions him. Otherwise, he has no reason to do that. There's another guy now by the name of Tacitus, who is a Roman writer and historian. And he says that the name Christians comes from a guy named Christus, who was executed by Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And he mentions some historical reference points here. All of them are perfect. All of them match up with what we see in the New Testament, right? Who, when was Jesus crucified? During the reign of, uh, under, the, under the governorship of Pontius Pilate, who signs his execution warrant, right? And then when did Pontius Pilate rule? During the reign of Tiberius. Yes, this is all known historically from other sources, right? Other sources mention these things. And so... His reference to Christus probably is a Latin version of the Greek word Christos, which is the Greek word for Christ, right? Christ in English is missing the Greek ending. Okay, so Christos is the Greek word for Christ. Christ is our English, you know, version of it. Well, um, again, Tacitus had no reason to... To, to have a positive reference. In fact, he calls Christianity dangerous and subversive. So he had no real reason to, to, to mention Jesus positively. He just mentions him because he considers him to be the historical founder of this group of people who practice a religion that could be dangerous to Rome. So again, kind of a hostile witness is, is what we would call, call this. And then you've got a guy named Lucian of Samosata, and he makes a reference to Jesus. Um, he doesn't mention him by name, but the way he describes him, you know it's Jesus. It can't be anyone else, right? And so he's, he's got this biography that he writes of a guy named Peregrinus Proteus, who is a philosopher. And the reference is brief, but he says there are these, this group of people called Christians and they worship a crucified sage, a crucified teacher who founded their beliefs. He says they believe in immortality, they consider each other as brothers, and they don't value worldly goods, but consider them common property to be shared among all of them. Now, you go to the Bible, and you can find every single one of these, these points referenced somewhere. The crucified figure Obviously, the, 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 the end game of Jesus' mission here on earth to, 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 to die for all that some might be saved, right? Jesus in the Gospel of John says, I give my life as a ransom for many. 
that's that's the event when he does that. You've got the idea of immortality. And, you know, this is something that Paul makes a reference to in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, being being raised up for glory. Uh, and uh, and the, the resurrection of Jesus being kind of the, the prototype for, for our own resurrection. You've got this uh, reference to Christians considering each other as, as brothers, right? We'll say spiritual family, just to, just to be a little more inclusive there. And what, what, is, what is kind of language does Paul use? Brother, sister, right? That's the, that's the language of the New Testament. That's the language of the early church. And then you've got this not valuing worldly goods, but considering them common property to be shared. What do you see in the book of Acts? Acts chapter 4, for instance. You've got people who identify others who are in need, and if they have something extra, they sell it, they get the money, and they share it, right? And so you have every single one of these things is known to this man. And so uh, very, very clearly, he knows something about early Christians and Christ. So in, in looking at all of these these witnesses and there are others i've just picked out a a few that that seem to be the best ones it's very clear that jesus really was a historical figure right he, his life really was something that that impacted people who who actually lived then and who still live now so in in looking at this this issue of did jesus really exist you know for some of us i think it's silly for some of us, I think it might be kind of, uh, well, who in the world would buy into that? And the fact is, there are people who believe that. And so one of the things about us needing to be ready to give others a reason for the hope that is in us that Peter talks about is being aware of these kinds of things. Now, not everyone's going to sit around and read the writings of ancient you know, Roman historians and, and that kind of thing. But we do need to be aware that they did exist because, uh, because it does help to support the historical truth, which is that Jesus really lived. And of course, if we know that, we have references to his life. We have references to his death. That death was for a reason. That death was so that we could be liberated from the power of sin and death and be raised to a new life as new creations Paul talks about in his letters with the Corinthians. So, well, everyone, that's just been a little flyby of, of the historical Jesus this morning. And I uh, hope that you're doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Hope you were able to weather the weather from last week and, uh, and all that. But um, uh, we'll keep going next week, uh, maybe wrap up next week and then start on a new topic. But... Um, uh, but again, I hope you're staying safe and doing well, and we'll look forward to seeing you the next time we are able to, to be together.